fear, uh, the dynamics of love, and the dynamics here, the dynamics of fear. And there's a um, and so in love we feel valued and we can open up and we can feel safe, and in fear we hide behind our fortress or we find ourselves caught up in power games. And often in those power games we find ourselves reacting. And when someone puts us down, it's auto sometimes it's actually automatic that we react. And I've actually had to stand back and say, hey, is reaction going to have the best outcome? Because when I react, who's calling the tune? The person who I react to. And so I like to think about action versus reaction. And when I act, I make the choice. When I react, I do something in response to what they did, and I actually become like a puppet to the person who I'm reacting to. And so in revenge, you can do the automatic thing and you can react and you can turn to power, and you might get power, but you might not end up respecting yourself or valuing yourself. And so I like to say to the people I work with, I want you to be an action man, not a reaction man. And so I'm helping them regain their value and reclaim, reclaim their right to make their own choices so that they can make decisions for themselves. And there's a big link between having a choice and feeling valuable. Remember I said I worked in rape and sexual abuse? In rape, someone doesn't accept you, doesn't let you say yes or no, you learn not to trust. In rape, someone uses power over you, putting themselves up and putting you down, and the outcome of that person using you is that you feel abused. And I like to break that abuse word down to the two elements, abuse an abnormal use of a person, using that person as a rung in your ladder to get your needs met at that person's expense. And of course, abuse makes you feel not valuable, you feel like a victim, you feel degraded, you feel worthless, you feel powerless. And survival means you might put a lid on the secret, survival means you might like to get on top so you can become a control-focused person. Or you might become a person who wants to be perfect so that no one will criticise you. Or you might become a judgmental person who doesn't trust people but puts everyone in a box and judges them. Or if your needs aren't met, you might feel bad and so you might actually use an anaesthetic called drugs and alcohol to turn off your pain. And I say to people, yes, you can do those things. But when the alcohol and drugs wear off, guess what? The pain comes back. When the alcohol and drugs wear off, guess what? Have the needs been met? No. And so my working definition of an addict is an addict is a valuable person who doesn't know it. And I want you to get your value back so you can be honest and say, hey, are drugs really meeting my needs? Are drugs just turning off my feelings? Or are, can I accept myself and say, I deserve to get my needs met? And my needs aren't because I'm a bad person, I'm because I'm a human being who deserves to feel safe, deserves to have a choice deserves to be able to learn and, and therefore I want people to accept themselves and their needs and be honest and say is what I'm doing working or not working? Remember I said denial is always part of addiction and so if you deny your past and don't learn from it you can actually be going go into a thing called self-abuse and the saddest consequence of someone else abusing you is that you may not value yourself and you may not learn from your past and you abuse yourself by repeating your past that's called self-sabotage, where we might hate ourselves so much that it pushes us into denial, and in denial we don't learn from the past, and then we punish ourselves by repeating the past. And we promise, and we bust, and we try, and we fail, and we try and be perfect, and we never can, and we end up judging ourselves as weak, and bad, and stupid, and worthless, and that can lead to self-abuse. And self-abuse can show itself in many ways. It can show itself in addiction, it can show itself in self-sabotage, it can show itself in self-harm. Some people actually cut themselves or bang their heads. And when those people do those things, I say, oh, I accept when you're doing those things, you are seeking relief. You want relief, I want relief. We've got the same agenda. We both want relief. I accept you and I support you to be honest about whether doing that actually meets your need or doesn't meet your need because you deserve to get your needs met. And if it doesn't meet your need, Let's talk about it so we can look at other ways so you don't have to get locked into self-harm or locked into self-depreciation or locked into self-sabotage. One of my patients was adopted out as a kid 
in the white Australia policy where they took children off their Aboriginal parents, especially if they had a white parent and an Aboriginal parent. And they were then put into foster care and the foster parents, mother and foster, foster mother and foster father, both abused him terribly, sexually, violently, tying him up, raping him, having other people rape him, locking him in rooms, making him eat his vomit, doing really horrendous things to him. And so he developed a lot of hate for people who had power over him. When he told the doctor that he'd been raped, the father bashed the doctor up. Fortunately, it went to court, and the court took him off those foster parents and put him in an institution. But in the institution, he was falsely accused of having sex with a little girl down the road. He wasn't actually interested in, actually, in having sex with her, actually. And so he became very bitter against authorities, and he just, when he got to be an adolescent, went out looking for people who had power, whether they were a policeman or an army person or whoever they were, and he'd always want to fight them, thinking that by fighting people, he could exercise his power didn't make him like himself, and he became an addict. He got a job as a bouncer, and people who were victims came to him and said, hey, I'm being a victim, I'm getting bashed up in my relationship, I want you to bash up my partner, and they paid him to bash the partner. They all got drunk, they all used drugs, the violence led to the murder of the, of the abusive partner. And so then the two people, the one who asked for the bashing and the one who did the bashing, both went to jail for murder. And so he's done more than 20 years for murder. He came to the alcohol and drug recovery group that I run, and the, the group is based on acceptance, where you are honest to set your own pace, make your own decisions, use the group when you want to, come back when you want to, leave when you want to, work out what your limits are, whether it's zero or whether it's one or two, we'll let you decide. We're not here to argue with you, we're here to, for you to nurture your honesty for your relief. I knew that he could never forgive himself for the murder. But one night, one of the boys came to group, and that night, before group, he'd been up Mount Kutha, and he actually planned to commit suicide up Mount Kutha. But instead of committing suicide, he decided to come to group. Yeah. And in group, he shared his pain. And when he shared his pain, his honesty inspired my other patient to say, hey, mate, if you can be honest and share your feelings about wanting to kill yourself, I can afford to be honest and get rid of my garbage too. And it always amazes me that damaged people can help each other. <laughs> it's inspiring. I love to see people getting better before my eyes while I'm just the observer. Just by making a safe place where people can be honest for themselves. And even if you don't talk, if you hear someone else getting relief out of honesty, you think, oh, it works for them, it might work for me. And so then instead of judging yourself and hating yourself and pushing yourself into isolation and loneliness and putting lids on your unresolved grief and guilt and shame, you can actually take the lid off when you're ready. Hear the when you're ready word? <laughs> when you're ready is a form of acceptance. Re respecting the choice applied to the clock when you're ready. And so he was able to actually share for the first time in group his guilt about the murder and the fact that he could never accept himself. And so one person's honesty inspires the next person's honesty and guess what? Two people get relief. When we use acceptance plus honesty, we get safe places where the healing can happen. Not from me rescuing or judging or running people's lives, but by me participating in the dynamics of love that produce the relief and the healing that a fear-based life can push people into the survival and the limitations of survival. I love how the Bible portrays love. You know, sometimes we make love an exam. You have to love me my way. You have to pass my expectations. You have to know how to show me what I want. You have to even pass my exam, and I'm not even going to give you the questions on the exam, but you've still got to pass it. <laughs> you know that sort of love where you have to guess what your partner wants, or you, <laughs> you get into trouble when you didn't even know what you were supposed to do? <laughs> Hmm, I'm glad that you're as human as me. <laughs> you know, in 1 John 4 verse 10, in that, remember I said 1 John 4 18, there's no fear in love? Well, before that, it says, in 1 John 4 verse 10, it says, this is what love is. It's not that we have loved God, but that he loved us. Yeah. In other words, 
God doesn't love us because we passed his exam. He loved us because he loves us. Full stop. <laughs> okay? So love is a gift, it's not an exam. And God showed his love to us. He didn't say, pass my exam and then I love you. And so this says, I can enjoy love now. And this says, I can enjoy love when? When I'm good, when I'm perfect, when I've got power, when, 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 when. <laughs> I'm not eligible when I'm 70, 80 or 90, I'm eligible now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. When I know that I can enjoy love now because I enjoy love that's possible, not love that's impossible. And so I love to bring love within reach. And when love is a gift, I can let my partner show love the way they choose, not the way that I have to try and extract. Yeah. Love is not a extracted reaction or a dependency where we say I depend on you to make me feel good it's no I'm valuable you're valuable let's give each other and when I give what I can when they give what they can guess what we're both giving the same it mightn't be the same amount of time it mightn't be the same amount of money but we're both giving what we can in 1 Corinthians 13 verse 4 it says love is not proud and so love is not winning some sort of competition that says, hey, I'm eligible now because like, I did all this for you. And so now I've achieved, you've got to love me. <laughs> love is not a competition. Love is not proud. Another version of love from the Bible is that love is not about two accountants getting together and balancing a ledger. You know, sometimes I did this for you, so you've got to do that for me. And so sometimes we use people by trying to buy them. I did this for you, so you've got to do that for me. And we put obligation on people. And when we put obligation, we feel like we have to say yes because we owe somebody something. And so sometimes parents do that to their kids. You should love me because I did this and this and this and this. And I've sacrificed for you and I've used all this elbow grease. So now you should love me my way to pass my test so that I can be proud because I produced this little puppet that does what I want. No, no, no. Love is about a parent saying to a kid, hey kid, I accept you, including a need to learn. Even if you go down a few dead ends, I'll still love you. Even if you go down a few dead ends that I went down, <laughs> come and talk to me about it, because I've been down there. Yeah. And so when parents model honesty and accessibility, it's better than when parents model perfect, who kids have to hide from, because they think, oh, I'll hurt my parents if they find out what I'm doing. And so when love is a gift, not an exam, and when love is about giving what we can and not keeping a ledger and not making each other feel obligated, we can then enjoy, you know, in 1 Corinthians 5, it says, love does not keep a record of wrongs. And so if you find yourself being attracted to being an accountant, thinking that you'll have a very functional relationship when you find another accountant, maybe you need to go shopping for a different partner. <laughs> In Matthew 5, verse 43, it says, You've heard it said, Love your friends and hate your enemies. But I tell you to love your enemies and pray for those who hurt you. So Jesus talked about a very radical form of love. Love that values people separate to what they do to you. It's not an automatic version of love, but it's radical because it produces healing. And when Jesus said, Do unto others as you'd like them to do to you, it's different to the world that says, Do unto others as they did to you. Jesus said, do unto others as you'd like them to do to you. It's actually a 180 degrees different way. And so if we live in a society that says we're going to get a safer society by treating people worse, I'm sorry it doesn't work. I'm very disillusioned that sometimes now we want to think that putting all the bad people in jail and treating them worse is going to make society safer. It just dehumanises people and makes them bitter and revengeful and makes them want to get revenge and come out worse. So locking people in solitary confinement for 23 hours a day dehumanises people. I've never seen a human being become better for any punishment where they get locked in solitary confinement for more than one month. After a month it becomes a dehumanising, not a learning outcome. The last government passed a law that says they put people in jail for 25 years for steroid possession. Steroid possession doesn't hurt anybody except the person who uses the steroids. 
And if you're a biker, you'll get 25 years on top, so that's 50 years. Which as well as devaluing the person and doesn't accept the fact that they probably just used the steroids because they wanted to have a big tough image that made themselves look Mr. Buff. <laughs> and probably they did that because they'd been a victim of bullying at school and they liked being Mr. Buff because they thought it made them Mr. Tough. <laughs> And I think that law was actually designed for one of my patients. Because he is a bikey and he does use steroids. And I think him, some of the other power dependent people in the pol politicians camp might have been a bit jealous. But I, I feel sorry for both actually, because it's not going to fix anything. And when they want to put people in pink jumpsuits, it's not about healing people. It's about saying, we're going to stigmatize you and try and demasculinize you and emasculate you to think that we can have power over you. It's not about the restoring of value people, and restoring the value people is where safety comes from. Love is not about dependency. In a dependent relationship, I find myself saying yes to please you. In a trust relationship, I can say yes or no because you accept me. In a dependency relationship, I'm scared to be honest in case you reject me, and so I sacrifice the truth to be your pretend friend. And I can be a good pretend friend, but I always live in fear that you'll know the truth and then you'll reject me. And so dependency between nice people kills honesty. Jesus said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And sometimes as Christians, we hear the first half of the sentence, love your neighbor. Mm. Oh, great. <laughs> I'll go out and I'll be a very good missionary and I'll save the world and I'll love the neighbour and I'll do everything and I'll become a workaholic and I'll do everything I can to make me feel good, making other people good and making other people saved and other people rescued and other people... But we didn't hear the second half of the message. Love your neighbour as you love yourself. And sometimes we hear that message, the second half as Christians, and think, oh, I'm not supposed to love myself. I'm supposed to hate myself and beat myself up with a lovely guilt trip. Jesus didn't actually sell guilt, <laughs> he sold love. Yeah. yeah, and you know what? Our freedom to love each other comes as we love ourselves because God loves us. Yeah. Not because I'm valuable because I've rescued people, because if I become a rescuer, people in jail will say to me, Wendell, you think you're better than me. I'll bring you down a peg or two to show you that you're not. <laughs> and if you're here to change me, you think you're better than me, you're judging me. And so while religion taught me the theory of love, Jao taught me the pragmatics of love, to let go judging other people. Yeah. And Jesus didn't say, Tom Brown was in jail and you're a good boy for visiting Tom Brown. He said, I was in prison and you visited me. Yeah. In other words, I learned about God by going to jail. Because I learned to accept people where they were at and the spin-off benefit was I learned to accept me where I'm at. And as I accept me for where I'm at, I don't have to delude myself that I can change other people or judge other people or even try. And it's very liberating for me to let go trying to change other people. Because if I can accept them and they can be honest with me, guess what? They get to change themselves, not me change them. And so when that person who'd been sexually abused as a kid went on to commit murder, went on to hate himself, went on to become so dependent on drugs that he couldn't let them go, he wanted me to participate in his addiction by participating in his denial. And because of our parole system, the parole system is based on doing urine tests and punishing people if they use drugs. And I don't think that that helps people feel valuable and it doesn't help them meet any of their needs. But equally, when he'd been using drugs, he actually asked me to participate in his denial. And he said, oh, I've got a really sore back and I can't go to parole. The reason he didn't want to go to parole was he didn't want to do a urine test because the urine test was going to show the drugs. And I, he wanted me to give you a certificate, too sick to go to parole to do the urine test. And I thought, oh, well, I accept this person, but I'm not comfortable going outside the truth in helping this person. And so I said to him, oh, I'm sorry about your sore back. I'm free this morning. I'll drive you to parole. <laughs> that didn't make him happy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And so when he did go to parole and when the urine did show positive for drugs, guess what? I was Mr. Bad Guy. And I'm now getting blamed for him going to jail because he used the drugs. And I said to him, hey, I really accept you and I really care about you and I really am your friend. That's why I'm honest with you, to your face. And if you ask me to participate in your denial or tell lies, I'm not free to do that. Yeah. Hear my eye language? I'm not free to do that. It's not you are a bad boy because you're trying to lie yeah. or you're a bad boy because you're trying to manipulate me. No. I accept you. I care about you. I'm not free to tell lies. Yeah. Eye language is safe language. You language is easy to come across as judgment, rejection. And I didn't make him use the drugs. <laughs> And I was sad he went to jail. And I actually had to help pay the rent for while he went to jail, so when he got out he'd still have a house. Because there was no house otherwise. There's no family. There's no house. But my acceptance means that I will do what I can. I won't do what I can't. I will do what I can. And I can be a friend, but I can't live his life for him, and I can't be honest for him, and I can't choose for him, and I accept that but I'm not going to sacrifice honesty to be his friend. And so now the respect is very good. He's now reconnected with his biological father's new wife. And his biological father just died. He went up there, visited the stepmother. They love him. They want him to be part of their world. They want him to come and live with them. And so for the first time in their life, somebody wants to love him. Someone wants to accept him and be with him. And so you should see the radical change. No, he doesn't want to use drugs. <laughs> Recently, parole said, no, you can't go there. And parole said, we insist on telling your stepmother all your history before you go there. Because parole like to save face. They don't like mud on their face. They don't want her to later say, oh, you didn't tell us about this person's past and so now we're going to protect ourselves by making you know. And he said, well, I've actually offered to tell her but she didn't want to know. And so he gave her a choice. Yeah. Now the choice is taken out of his hands and they've chosen to tell her anyway and she still wants to be his friend. Yeah. Love is bigger than the past. Yeah. Love is bigger than the dead ends. Yeah. But love does value people and love does include honesty and if it doesn't, it's not called love, it's something else. I'm really convinced that love works. I've got a lot of evidence and I love collecting it. Today I've shared with you how I see that it works. I hope you've enjoyed being affected and I hope you enjoy spreading it. Thanks very much. We're going to have a question and answer time now. Um, for about, uh Oh, ten minutes. Does anyone have any comments or questions? Just a hands up. Don't throw the question out. We have one or two. Okay. We're going to send the microphone around, and I'm going to get you when we can use the other mic. Um, so Christine's got one to start. We'll get you over to use the microphone so that we can get the questions. And Wendell, if you could do us a favour uh, and repeat the question, you can take the uh, mic out of the um, stand if you like. If, um, Wendell, you could repeat the question because you've got the um, video microphone. Thanks, Christine. Hi. Um, my question is, did you say that if, say, a case of a young boy, he's sexually abused, and then when he grows up, he abuses his partner's children, have you said that that's his anger made him do that? Because, you know, our thoughts were if you're sexually abused and hated it so much, you would never ever do it to your own kids. Hmm. I'm Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. I'm interested in your question because there is a myth in our society that all victims become perpetrators. And that myth means that some victims are scared to be honest in case people then say because you're a victim you are becoming a perpetrator and we won't trust you. And I've certainly seen people who've told their families I was abused and then they say oh well because you're a victim we now won't let you have any interaction with the nieces and nephews. Because the myth says all victims become perpetrators. In fact in my work about 6% of victims do become perpetrators. So it's not true that all victims become perpetrators. 
Equally, if we look at a population of people who do perpetrate abuse, probably between 50 and 90% of perpetrators have been victims. So most, most perpetrators have been victims, but not all victims become perpetrators. My experience is that if people regain their value, regain getting their needs met through honesty, not through power or denial, then they don't have to be a perpetrator. So that's why I want victims to regain their value, so that then they don't turn to power to get their needs met. People who don't feel valuable can use power. People who don't feel valuable might use denial, where they don't see a limit until they go past the limit. And they get shocked thinking, how could I do something when I hate someone doing that to me? And so, not all victims become perpetrators, but most perpetrators have been victims. The circuit breaker is, if a person can regain their value, relate as an equal, learn to be honest and to respect honesty from other people, then they can use love to get their needs met, not power or denial to get their needs met. I certainly have seen a priest who was sexually abused as a kid. And he told his parents, but then the whole process was taken out of his hands and everyone talked about it, but he wasn't involved in the healing process. He tried to get a sense of okayness by becoming a good boy and becoming a priest. And it can be dangerous in our society that people might think, I'm valuable because I deny my sexual needs so that now I can see, be seen to be virtuous because I've denied that part of my life. God actually made us as whole people and he made our bodies as well as our minds. And so God wants us to actually enjoy our bodies in healthy ways, not use power over another person to use our bodies in a powerful way over another person. And so while he was denying his needs through trying to be celibate, it was actually dangerous because he was using denial and denial didn't meet his needs to feel valuable or to have intimacy or to have love. And I'm not saying if you choose to be celibate at any point in your time that that's a bad thing. If that's you accepting yourself and being honest, then I respect your celibacy. But I like to add an R to the word celibate, and I always like to call it celebrate. Yeah. And there's only one R between the two words. And to celebrate means that we value ourselves and value each other and value our bodies and enjoy our bodies and enjoy sharing our bodies with each other. And if we can do that, we can get our love needs met in healthy relationships where we value ourselves and each other. We are honest for ourselves and let people be honest with us, which opens the door to trust that's called intimacy. And I think we all long to have that connection with another person. And we all deserve to have that as well. But if we're relying on denial or power, Denial and power are the things that cause abuse. In abuse, someone has power over you and puts themselves up and puts you down using the power and they deny you a choice. They deny you the right to say yes or no. They deny you the right to say this is comfortable or this is not comfortable. So they come inside your space and don't value you. And so in abuse, there's power and denial. In survival, there can be reliance on power and denial. That's why I want people to come past survival to thriving where they can move past denial and power. Otherwise, if you're dependent on power and denial, that can make people vulnerable to being abusive. It's a hard answer, but it's an answer, it's an answer that I like to understand because remember I said I want victims and perpetrators to regain their value? That's how we prevent abuse. Not by saying you should do this or you shouldn't do that and trying to sell people guilt. Guilt doesn't help people feel valuable. It doesn't help them learn how love works. Alan? Paul, um, Paul never called for a forced celibacy as what the problem has become. He said, I would that all men would be as I am, but not every man has that property to God. So, say in the priesthood, if they fell in love with someone, that's where the problem comes in. They can't leave and marry the person unless they're put out of the priesthood. Yeah. So that brings in a bondage for not understanding the scriptures properly. That should be a let out for a priest. If he wanted to be married, he should be able to leave clearly the priesthood. Yeah, because without the stigma associated with yeah. it. And I thank you for that. I didn't tell you the second half of the story. <laughs> that man in becoming a priest didn't get his needs met and he then went on 
to be abusive of women and boys and girls. And he came to me wanting help so he wouldn't abuse again. And I said, great, that's fantastic. I'm happy to help you not abuse again. That's why I want you to regain your value and regain the freedom to be honest. Not think that denial is going to make you a safe person. I actually did a mediated re revolution. It was a revolution. <laughs> a mediated resolution between one of my patients and by the priest who raped her in the chapel at the Royal Brisbane Hospital. She was an inpatient and she went to the chapel but the priest raped her in the chapel. And she was so angry. She was so angry that she couldn't tell anybody. And when she went home, she was immobile that she needed to leave the door open for people to come and help her and the priest would come and rape her in her house. And so she was really angry and she wrote him a letter saying, I'd like to write my life story and I want to include your name in my life story. Can I have permission? <laughs> and he didn't want that to happen. But as well as wanting to express her anger through writing the book, she actually expressed her anger through self-sabotage where she actually turned to alcohol for relief. And the alcohol didn't deliver the relief she wanted and it alienated from all her children. And so the abuse was ongoing because now she was self-abusing. So we worked through the alcohol issues and I helped her find better ways to get relief than self-harm. And then she said, I, I don't want to go to court because many people find that the court's based on another power game with a winner and a loser and an adversarial model which may not make people feel valuable or safe. So I think all victims should have a choice to go to court or not to go to court but to have avenues to regain their value if they don't choose to go to court. That's why she came to me. She wanted a mediated resolution, so I contacted the priest and said, this lady would like a mediated resolution for the purpose of re restoring her value. Will you participate? And sure enough, he came along and she came along and she actually shared her story with him in my office and said, this is what happened, this is how I feel about it and this is the effect it's had on me. So he could listen and he could hear her being honest and reclaiming her right to be honest and she said some important words. She said, I'm now going to let you own what you did to me. That was very healing because sometimes victims blame themselves for what the other person did. And if a victim blames themselves then they stay not feeling valuable. But I wanted her to regain her value and use honesty to let him own what he did, not her blame herself for what he did. And he then said, I own what I did and I'm sorry for what I did. And sorry is a very healing word because sorry means that then the victim stops blaming themselves and they can let the perpetrator own the action. Our adversarial court model won't even let perpetrators say sorry to victims. And so our society hasn't begun yet to look at healing for sexual abuse. At the end of the visit and the end of the mediation, she said, I now realize that I don't have a reason to drink anymore. In other words, she wanted to regain her value and not self-abuse by doing things that alienated her family and isolated her from her unresolved abuse. So that's why when I talk about resolution, I mean restoring the value in really practical ways. Any more questions?